Well, hello, People's Church family. It's good to see more of you back in the building today. You're looking beautiful as ever, and it's good to lift up Jesus. And I do want to welcome all of our locations, and so glad to have you here today, Midwest City and Northwest and Mabel Bassett, all you ladies there, all of you joining us online, welcome, welcome, welcome today uh, to People's Church and our Indianapolis campus, huge announcement today, this is their first day meeting in their new building, so praise the Lord for that. Uh, we wanted to move in in March, but because of COVID-19, God had different plans, but they're meeting today and can't wait to get the update from Pastor Chris and Jamie on how the Lord moved and we are honoring our graduates today and I apologize and I did forget to mention last service that the uh, gra that the graduates we are uh, having a video rolling before service and after service and so if you want to hang around and just see that it's also happening online as well and also those of you uh, that uh, got, got your pictures and all in on Friday uh, our video was already done and so you are on our People's Church Instagram story so if you'll go to People's Church Instagram. We're honoring graduates there as well. We're going to compile all of that together, all of the pictures, uh, and we're going to have the, the video updated, and we're going to put it on our Facebook page and just honor all of our graduates. We're proud of you. Congratulations. We honor you today, whether you're in, the, in one of our locations or online. And I want to just tell you, listen, graduates, pursue Jesus with all of your heart. Love God with all of your heart. He's got big plans for you. So dream big and pursue those dreams. Come on, dream big, dream big and go for it. I salute you. I honor you. I'll be sending all of our graduates a book, but I wanted just to take a moment and say congratulations to all of our graduates. Well, you know, at People's Church, we believe in ministering and helping the hurting and those in need. And uh, one of the parts of our community, both in Indianapolis and Oklahoma City, that has been in need are our elderly during this uh, COVID-19 season. And uh, not only in our community, but in the nursing homes. And so we, we're wanting to help and just make an even greater impact to those in the nursing home. And so I need you to do something to help me, People's Church. And it's not an offering. You give so generously. I'm not taking no, is he going to take up a special offering? No. So that's not what I'm talking about. I need something else for you. Your giving's already going to provide them tablets, and we're going to be providing gift baskets and puzzles and on and on and on to our nursing homes. As a matter of fact, let me just quickly mention the nursing homes that we're going to be blessing. We're going to be blessing Grace Living Center, Emerald Care Center, Middale Skilled Nursing Home, and then Indianapolis, we're going to be blessing North Capital Nursing Home. Home. And here's what I need you to do. We asked the nursing home, how can we be the biggest blessing besides monetary and providing uh, tablets so they can interact with their family via technology? What else can we do to help and be a blessing? They said, you know what we really bless the elderly? If your church family would take time out to write them a note, they would be so encouraged. So we're going to flood them with people's church notes to tell them that we love them. We, we appreciate you. We're praying for you. You can share your favorite scripture or a paragraph. So here's what I need you to do. So this next week, would you email your note, note to uh, the, 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 those that are elderly and let them know, email it to care at people's church.tv. Come on, I need you to get that down. Now care at people's church.tv. It could be a few sentences, a paragraph or a page, but write a note and let's bless the elderly. How many of you know we cannot Forget about our elderly. We need to be a blessing. Come on, when your pastor's 99 years old, if Jesus tarries, don't forget me. Come on, let, let's show love. So let, thank you for doing that care at peopleschurch.tv and just writing your note. Well, in, in these uh, perilous times that we are living in, I have been working hard with all of the racial tension to create dialogue and conversation. So I actually took a week or two ago, time out with our entire staff. And we had a, a just a, a race conversation on talking about it and what we can do. And just it was a just a healthy dialogue because I want to create that kind of space to talk. I don't think we have these kind of conversations enough and really talk to move the ball forward. On Wednesday night, we had a great conversation with our panel here at Deeper Night. It was a powerful time. If you missed it, it's on our Facebook page. Watch the conversation, just this initial conversation to equip people, to give people tools on how to have a conversation about race and race relationships and racism and all those types of topics. So I, I've been talking to, to pastors 
pastors and, and churches and Zoom calls and trying to do my best to, to enter this space and to teach people how we have this conversation. I, I was even re reached out to by uh, the governor in his office and, and would, would, would I help on a racial conversation? And I said, absolutely, yes. I'm not about Republican, Democrat, independent, don't really care what you are, praise the Lord. But I do care about moving the ball forward and making progress and lifting up the name of Jesus Christ. And I want to encourage you, would you do the same thing? Would you not shy away from this subject? Would you talk about it? Would you make it a part of your dialogue? It is so needed in our world. And who better to do it than the church? Would you say amen to that? Come on, let the church lead the way. Oh, everybody's not clapping. I hope everybody in line is clapping right now. Let the church lead the way in these kind of conversations. Amen. You know, last week I began this series on the last days. And in Matthew 24, I talked to you about the signs of the time that we're living in the last days. Jesus gave us signs that we could know that we're in the last days. And we studied those signs and as we looked at those signs, it's very obvious every sign is happening. We talked about, if you missed the message, get online and watch the message. We talked about the sign of deception, the sign of disaster, the, the sign of difficulty, uh, of denial, of darkness. All the signs are there that Jesus talks about. The darkness piece that he, he simply says, in, in the last days, you'll know that I'm getting ready to come because there'll be an increase of wickedness. And we're seeing that with, with hatred and uh, racism and the George Floyd and others who have been murdered and then just all the division and the riots. And this past week, police officers and civilians were both killed. We talked about dominance and how the gospel is dominating and, and penetrating places because so many churches have went online in this season and the gospel is going places it never has before. And Jesus said, when you see all of these signs, here's what you can know. I'm getting ready to return. And, you know, when you think about Jesus returning, it even reminds me of my childhood. I remember when I first gave my life to the Lord, I went to, I started going to church faithfully and I, I went to a revival service. Anybody ever attend, attend a revival service, one of them Sunday through Wednesdays, you know, revival service? I went through a revival service and they had an evangelist there from out of state. And I'll never forget the evangelist when I was 17 on, I don't remember if it was a Monday or Tuesday night, he was preaching about the return of the Lord. And he preached it hot. Oh, my, my, I never heard preaching quite like this. He said, the Lord Jesus is coming. He said he could come tonight. He said he could come in the next 10 seconds. Are you ready for the return of the Lord? I had just given my life to Christ. I think, I think I'm ready. I'm not sure. He said, are you ready for the return of the Lord? Jesus could come right now and you can be left. He's coming in 10, 9, 8. Are you ready? I'm like, oh, Lord Jesus, 7, 6, 5. He's coming right now. Are you ready? Hell is hot. Are you ready for the return of the Lord for a three, two? If you're not ready, you better shoot your hand there. The Lord is coming right now. One. My Lord, I lifted both hands. Anybody know? Like, <laughs> he worked me into a frenzy that night. Listen, I'm not doing this series to work you into a frenzy. I'm not trying to play on your emotions. I want you to understand what is happening in our world today is talked about by Jesus. I want you to look at what's happening in our world, not from a worldly point of view, but from a biblical point of view. I want you to understand what the Bible says so that you can be ready for the return of the Lord. I want you to be prepared. I want you to be ready. I want you to know what the Bible says. We have so many people who do not know what the Bible says. So what I want to do today, I'm going to just take you to school for just a few moments and, and I need you to lean in because you need to be aware of this. You need, need to know what happens at the end of time. I want to take you to the book of Revelation. One of the most complicated books in the Bible. And I want to just give you a really quick overview of the book of Revelation. And then I want to end with some practical next 
step. So we're going to look at this book and help you understand so that you can be ready for the return of the Lord. I would take a lot of notes today and whatever you can't capture via notes, the messages will be archived so that you can go back and really sink your teeth in on what's going to happen. What does the book of Revelation say? The first thing I want you to understand about the book is the church age, the church age. You find this in Revelation chapter one through three, the very last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. And John, who was one of the 12 disciples, was banished onto an island called Patmos because of his faith in Christ. And Patmos is located between Greece and Turkey. And in Revelation chapter one and verse 10, John was, scripture says, he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. He had a vision or a revelation from Jesus. And Jesus said this to John, I need you to write down things that were, that are, and things that are to come. And the book of Revelation is what's called a prophetic book. And the majority of the book is about things to come, prophecy, foretelling the future, about things to come. But, but, but catch this. The first three chapters of the book of Revelation are not about prophecy. They're they're written to the church. It's the church age. That's what we're living in right now, the church age. This, This present age is the church age. And there's some incredibly important things that we need to know about the church age. Those first three chapters will prepare you to be ready for the return of the Lord. We're living in that age. And I'm going to come back at the end of the message and talk to you for a few moments about the church age and the adjustments we need to make as we look at those seven churches in the church age. But but the second thing that the book of Revelation kind of talks about is the rapture of the church. And, And this is when Jesus takes the church from the earth And only those who don't know Jesus are left on the earth. Maybe some of you have watched one of those Left Behind movies. Anybody ever see one of those movies Left Behind? A few of you have. Well, let me just tell you, church, you don't want to be left behind. When you read the book of Revelation, you don't want to be left on the earth during judgment. And there are Christians who have different views on what will take place or when the rapture will take place. There are some that are pre-trib. They believe that the church will be taken away before the tribulation period. We're gonna talk about that in just a moment. There are other Christians who believe in mid-trib, that they believe that God, Jesus is gonna remove the church at the three and a half year mark, at the middle of the tribulation. And then there are post-trib Christians who believe that, that, that Christians are gonna go through the tribulation period and then God's gonna take the church from the earth. And now at People's Church, understand this. This is not a dividing issue for our church. We're all on the same team, even if we disagree on end time events. And I know some of you are big time into end time events. You got your prophecy charts everywhere and you got it all mapped out and God bless your heart. I'm not quite like you. But even if you have your prophecy charts all marked out, we still need to approach this subject with humility. We don't have it all figured out. Now, 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 my my personal lean, my my personal view is I lean towards pre-trib. And in uh, two or three weeks or so, I'm going to talk to you in depth about the rapture and and what happens. And we're going to dive into it. But but just for a a few moments, let me quickly share one reason why I lean towards pre-trib. God's going to take us before the tribulation. In Revelation chapter number one through three, the word church or churches is mentioned 18 times. But after chapter three, the word church is not mentioned one time until it talks about heaven. Now, my personal view on why the church is not mentioned until heaven again is because the church is not on the earth, that God raptured the church away from the earth. Revelation chapter four and verse number one says this, after this I looked and there before me was a door standing open in the earth uh, and, the, and, and the voice I, I, I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, and many believe right here is where the, rapture, the church is raptured, come up here. 
Now, I don't have time to teach it to you today. I'll teach it to you later in the series. But, 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 but the, when the second coming of the Lord happens, God actually comes to earth and, 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 and we, well, heaven actually comes to earth. And right here, the Bible says we're caught up, which is in another part of scripture. I'm not going to teach it today. He says, come up here and I will show you what, you must take, to, what, what must take place after this. At once I was in the spirit and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had an appearance of Jasper and Carnelian, a rainbow resembling an emerald encircled throne, encircled the throne, surrounded the throne. No, notice this, were 24 other thrones and seated on, the, they, on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. And now many scholars believe this. You got to catch this. Many scholars believe the 24 elders represent the 12 tribes of Israel in the Old Testament and represent the 12 disciples or the church in the New Testament. So, so, so they, they believe, many scholars believe that this is a picture of the Old and the New Testament church worshiping God together right after the rapture. Let's look at number, number three, the tribulation period. We'll get, we'll get more on the rapture later in the series, the tribulation period. And that, that, the tribulation is found from Revelation chapter 6 through 19. It's compl complicated. There's a lot of symbolism and possibly John is, is writing about 21st century events, and he's trying to describe them, and, but he's never seen it. He's never experienced a nuclear war or an airplane or, or helicopters. He's never experienced any of it, any of it but he's trying, he's trying to describe it the best way he can. And the tribulation period is a seven-year period that consists of three judgments that have seven parts to each judgment. So first, there's the seal judgment. You can find this in Revelation chapter 6, verse 1, through Revelation chapter 8, verse 6. Then there, secondly, is the seven trumpet judgments. Revelation chapter 8, verse 7. Somebody ought to write this down because you, 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 you might not make the rapture. You, you might need to know this now. You better, better get this down. Huh? Revelation chapter 8, verse 7, through Revelation 14, verse 20. And then the third is the seven bowls judgment. And that's found in Revelation 16, verse 1 through 21. Now, now understand that during the beginning of the first seal, there's this person called the Antichrist. And, and you say, well, Pastor, why is he called the Antichrist? Well, here's why. Because he is anti-Christ. That's deep in the church. I'm the deepest preacher you will ever meet. He is against Christ, and that's why he's called anti-Christ, and, and he's a powerful person with, with great charisma. He, he engineers a peace agreement and promises the entire world peace and stability. And listen, the entire world is deceived by this man and thinks that the Antichrist is such a phenomenal leader and they follow him. And, and th the, the, throughout years of the church, the church has been trying to guess who the Antichrist is, this powerful leader that's going to get the whole world to follow him. And there's been this, they've guessed this political leader or this person or the, the this person, a lot of guessing has happened. Listen to me, church. I have been processing. I have been praying. And I really believe, I just want to, I really want to help you. I really believe I know who the Antichrist is. I, and listen to me. You need to know so you're not fooled and follow the Antichrist. Here's the Antichrist. Jerry Jones, I mean, if we don't win a Super Bowl, if he don't bring me a Super Bowl, that brother's the Antichrist. Give me a Super Bowl, Jerry! Okay, I'm just playing. I'm just playing. I, I don't know who the Antichrist is, but, but you need to be aware that he's going to come on the scene. So, so okay, let, let, me, let me move on. Let me move on. Let me move on. So, so, so then you have... The, the, the seven seal judgments, the seven seal judgments. And you find this in Revelation chapter 7, church, verse 3 through 4. And, and when, when you read this, God raises up and sends out 144,000 evangelists. And these 144,000, they don't follow the Antichrist. They, they, they give their life to Christ in the tribulation, and they tell the whole world to follow Jesus. And many people become followers of Christ because of these 144,000. I want you to catch this. Even during the tribulation period, God is still full of mercy, 
full of grace, full of patience. He's doing everything that he can to reach people with the good news of Jesus and sends 144,000. Revelation chapter 7 and verse 9 says, After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne. And in front of the Lamb, they were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. Verse 14 says this, I answered, sir, you know. And he said, These are they who have come out of the great Tribulation. They have washed their robes and, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And many people are going to be saved. Many people are going to give their life to Jesus during the tribulation. And I know what some of you are thinking right now. Woo, that's good news. I think I'm just going to wait to serve God. It's good news. I'm glad to hear. Don't do that. Don't do that. Two, two reasons why. Number one is you might die before the great tribulation and miss your opportunity to follow Jesus. And number two, if you think what we're experiencing right now on earth is bad and chaotic and painful, when you read Revelation, it cannot compare to what's gonna happen during the great tribulation and the murder and the Christians that are going to be martyred. And it's, 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 it's just horrific when you, when you read about it. And now, now check this out. Let, let, let me bring you back. I want to give you a quick overview. You got to understand this. After the first three and a half years of the tribulation, at the midpoint, there's the, 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 trumpet, the trumpet judgment and the seven bow judgments. And what happens is they just get increasingly worse and worse and worse when you study the book of Revelation. And then what happens is everyone is under the delusion that the Antichrist is this awesome leader. And then God sends two Witnesses is how Revelation describes it in Revelation chapter number 11. And they preach salvation and repentance to the world. They do some incredible miracles and people give their life to Christ. But here's what happens. The Antichrist kills the two witnesses. Here's what's getting ready to happen in the future. You got to understand this. During the tribulation period, the Antichrist will kill these two witnesses and they are fatally wounded. And your Bible is so awesome. The, the prophecy, the foretelling, because the Bible says when it was written, there was no technology. There was no way for that, that this could happen. But the Bible says that the whole world would watch these two witnesses dead on the street for three and a half days. It can happen today now because we have the technology for it. But they, they will be dead on for three and a half days and the entire world will witness. And then God will raise these two witnesses from the dead and then takes them to heaven. And then people turn against the Antichrist and he is fatally wounded. And then what happens, a quick overview, Satan miraculously heals the, the, the Antichrist. And the world will rally around the Antichrist and he will influence the entire world to follow him. And one thing that will help the entire world to follow him is the Bible talks about this false prophet. He comes on the scene and he will perform miracles and he's going to really influence the world to follow the Antichrist. And the, uh, the scripture says that he's going to set up this image that the entire world will have to worship the image of the Antichrist. And then everybody, if you want to buy or sell, you will have to take the mark of the beast. Anybody know the number of the mark of the beast? Oh, shout it louder than that. Come on, write it in the comments right now. Six, six, six is the mark of the beast. And then the world will rally behind the Antichrist and the false prophet, and they go to war against God. You've seen movies about this war. It's called the Battle of Armageddon. And God easily defeats Satan. The, he defeats the Antichrist and the false prophet. Number four, number four, really quick, really quick, really quick. Number four, number four, let me give you a quick overview. I'm getting ready to give you some practical application. Number four is the millennial reign of Christ. So immediately following the tribulation period is the marriage supper of the Lamb. See, it's called the marriage supper of the Lamb because we're married to Christ. We're his bride. And what happens is we're going to eat a great meal with Jesus. Anybody like to eat? Come on, I, I've been studying the Greek words there around the marriage supper of the land. One of those words is chitterling. So I just, I'm just wanting you to chit. So let me move right on. Let me move right on here. 
It's called the marriage supper of the Lamb. And, 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 and then I want you to know that after the marriage supper of the Lamb, we're going to spend 1,000 years on, uh, with Christ on earth the millennial reign. And after the thousand years, Satan is going to be released for a short time and then God deals with him once and for all. You can find this in Revelation 20, verse one through six. And then the fifth thing is this, we're talking about a quick overview of the book of Revelation. Number five is judgment day. We're gonna talk about this later in the series. Number six is a new heaven and a new earth. And we'll talk about this later in the series. I just gave you the quickest overview of the book of Revelation in the history of humanity. I deserve a hand clap or something. <laughs> so you got an overview of the book of Revelation. And what I want to do now is spend the rest of my time and next week on focusing on chapter two and three, because that's where we are in the church age. You can still do something now before the tribulation period begins. I, I don't want anybody to go through the tribulation. And so I want to prepare you. It's so important, church, that you understand those seven churches. And today and next week, we're going to talk about the church age, where we're living and see what the Bible says to us, the church today, on how we need to be prepared for the coming of the Lord. So I want to give you seven ways the church gets ready for the end. Seven ways the Bible tells us how we get ready. We're going to cover two today and five next week. The church age, you got to understand this if you're going to be ready for the coming of the Lord. Number one is this, is the return, return to your first love, when he writes to the church at Ephesus. Notice this in Revelation chapter two and verse number four, it says, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, this is for the church today, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. The church of Ephesus got distracted like a lot of churches are getting distracted today. And they started to fall out of love with Jesus. Church, don't fall out of love with Jesus. The most important thing that we can do is to love God with all of our heart. That's why we got to pray like never before, read our Bibles like never before, worship like never before, go to church like never before. Until you get back to church, there's nothing like being in the room, but while you're online for the next couple of weeks or so, don't miss church. You got to worship. You got to seek God. You got to get close to God. You got to love God with all of your heart. The Bible says this, the most important thing that we can do, listen, don't fall out of love with Jesus in Matthew 22, verse 36. It says, teacher, which is the greatest commandment? commandment and the law. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Church, when you love God with all your heart, let me tell you what happens. Because you have the Holy Spirit, in, Spirit inside of you as a Christian. So when you love God, you have to love people. And so he says the second commandment is this in verse 39. Love your neighbor. Come on, everybody shout neighbor. Come on, in the comments right there on your watching online, just write the word neighbor. Write neighbor. That's a key word for today. Neighbor. Love your neighbor as yourself. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 20 tells us that you cannot love God and hate people. When, when you love God, you will have to love God people because God is love and his people love others. We love all people, but because of our sin nature, because of our flesh, human beings have the propensity to love people who are like them. We, we, we tend to build relationships with people who are like us. 
Black people tend to build relationship with black people and white people tend to build relationship with white people and brown people tend to build relationship with brown people and, and Democrats build relationship with Democrats and Republicans build relationship with Republicans and Baptists with Baptists and Methodists with Methodists and Pentecostals with Pentecostals and moms with other moms and dads with dads and singles with, with singles and CEOs with CEOs and teachers with teachers and pastors with pastors. We naturally tend to gravitate and to build relationships with people who are like us. And, and so we, we like to group, and we have our in-group. And our in-group is oftentimes like us. And people not in our in-group are in our out-group. And here's what happens. Because of this flesh, people who are in our in-group, we understand them. We, we have more patience for them. We tend to know more about their struggles and challenges. We, we tend to give people in our end group more grace. We tend to give them the benefit of the doubt. But people that are in our out group, we don't usually naturally build relationships with them. We tend to be uncomfortable to be around them because they maybe look different than us, think different than us. We, we, we don't understand them. So, so we tend not to give them grace. We, 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 we tend not to give them the benefit of the doubt. We tend to judge. We, we tend to prejudge them. We, 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 we tend to have, be, be quick to draw conclusions about them. Human nature, and yet, yet, yet Jesus says this, if you listen, if you want to get this right, love your neighbor, love everybody, not people just like you. You know, my, my, my wife and I, we have four children, and I have to tell you, although I was present in the hospital room for every birth, I, I don't understand it. Um... I have never experienced giving birth. And yet I can talk, watch my wife talk to other ladies about birth. And man, they have something so in common. It's in-group language. Like, yeah, you know, and my water broke. You know, and I'm like, ah, oh, the water, water broke. Yeah, don't get it. And it's like, my water broke. I had to breathe. I'm like, okay, yeah, okay, all right. Yeah, I don't get it. Like, yeah, and then I, you know, I went in the hospital and I got there and I got there and I was in pain. I mean, the pain went from a one to a two and dilated and a, and a this and, a, and I got an epidural and I got a C-section and, and they're talking and I do not get it. I've never had anything like that come out my body and Lord, don't ever let it happen in Jesus' name. I don't get it. I don't understand it. It's a group that I just will never understand. But because that's my wife, I love her. She's my neighbor. You know what I've done? I, I don't dismiss it. I don't go, man, your pain's not real. I've never been through your kind of pain. <laughs> I'm like, no. What are you, what are you going through? You, you, it hurts. You feel what? A kick? When she told me her water broke, I thought mine broke. I started running. And, you know, I'm like, hey, my blood, Jesus. I, you know, she, get me to the hospital. You know, I'm like, I'm, I care. I was there. I had empathy. I, I, I still don't understand. But, man, I listen and learn and try to be in tune to her pain. You know, I'm over here bringing ice chips. And you know what I mean? What you need, girl? Want me to rub your feet? What you need? Some, some Vaseline on them bad boys? What you need? <laughs> let, let, let me say this to you. You know what we oftentimes do when people that are different than us? been through different pain. We don't take time to get to know them. Why are they doing all of that? Why are they acting like that? Have you ever sat down and said, let's have a conversation? Let's talk. You're my neighbor, and I love you. And although I've never been through your experience, I want to love you well. I don't want to prejudge. I don't want to have biases. 
I want to sit down and talk and love you like my neighbor. Return to your first love. Love God. And when you love God, you're going to love people. Number two is this. Number two is this. I want you to see this second church. This church, I cannot overemphasize how important it is to study these seven churches and to understand how you prepare for the return of the Lord. We're in the church age. Number two is this. Remain faithful. This is Smyrna, the church at Smyrna. You find this in Revelation chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. He says, I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not. There's there's some division happening, but, but you are a synagogue of Satan because so much is happening and division is happening. He says, do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you. And you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful even to the point of death. I will give you the crown of life. And people's church, be faithful to God. Be faithful to God during difficult seasons. Hear your pastor, I got to prepare you. Don't just follow Jesus when things are good. Be faithful to God during difficult times. Let me remind you one of the signs we talked about last week that we're living in the last days and Jesus is close to returning. Scripture says about the last days, Matthew 24, verse 10. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. Jesus says a sign of the last days is people are going to turn away from the faith, turn away because of trouble and difficulty and pain and trials and hate, and they will begin to hate one another. He talks about this as well in the book of Matthew chapter 13 with the parable of the sower. It says in verse 20, catch this, the seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. People's church, be faithful to God no matter what happens do not allow the coronavirus job loss financial struggle racial tension murders racism hate sickness problems trials or pain to cause you to turn away from God and let your heart grow cold be faithful to serve God be faithful to honor God be faithful to live for God it's key It reminds me of the old hymn that says, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, I still will follow. No turning back. My cross I carry till I see Jesus. No turning back back. Be faithful to God even to the point of death. It's key. Number two is this. I want you to see a second thing from the church at Smyrna about being faithful, and that is be faithful to God during divided times. Talks about how the church had slander and a synagogue of Satan, and we've we got to be faithful to God during divided times. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 25 says, Jesus knew their thoughts And said to them, every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined. And every city or household divided against itself will not stand. And church, the devil is busy in our nation causing division. The devil traffics in disunity and division. And he wants the church in this critical hour in our nation to be divided. He knows a kingdom, a church divided against itself will not be ruined. And I'm talking about the church at large. The church, if it's divided, we cannot stand. And what the devil wants is black and brown Christians and white Christians, and he wants us against one another and to turn on one another. The enemy is working overtime to divide the church. And I want you to hear your pastor because I'm saddened. I'm saddened in my heart when I see Christians. I even see pastors right now, church leaders, putting divisiveness out. 
speaking device of putting things on social media that are demeaning and divisive to the body of Christ. And church, as your pastor, I got to prepare you. Church, be on the lookout for Christians and pastors and church leaders who are trying to cause division. They're being used of the devil. You say, pastor, you're talking strong here. Let me read you from your Bible today. Romans 16 and verse 17 says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them, for such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. Church, the only way that we can win and see change in our nation and world is by working together. And that's not easy. I'm not here trying to pretend as though working together is easy. But as Christians, people who have the Holy Spirit inside of us, we have the ability to work together. We have the ability. We can work together. Christians, I'm talking about black, white, brown, red, yellow, Democrats, Republicans, protesters, non-protesters, Baptists, Methodists, Pentecostal, Nazarene. We have to work together together and that's work because you know what that means to work together that means we really have to sit down and talk to one another and talk to people who are different than us have a different perspective skin color worldview and it's uncomfortable but we need to talk we have to work hard to listen because oftentimes we come to conversation only with our perspective. And we never listen to the stories and pains and fears and struggles of someone else. We have to work hard to show grace because when you enter in these conversations, you know what makes people back away? It's because you're going to be misunderstood and it's going to be uncomfortable. And you're going to say some things wrong and you're going to mess some stuff up when you start talking. But don't back away. Show each other grace. Let's have grace as we talk and learn and grow together. We have to work hard to come up with kingdom of God solutions together. We, we need to speak up and be a part of changing racism and hurt and, and hate and, and murder and injustice and, and sexism and sex trafficking. But we need to do it together. We're better together. We're better together. The Bible says in Psalm chapter 133 and verse 1, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. He goes on to talk about this unity in verse 3. He says, it is if, it is if, the, is if the dew of Hermon was falling on Mount Zion, the anointing. For the Lord, there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. God puts his blessing on unity. He puts his blessing. On unity. Let's be unified so that we can really see change and make a difference in our world and be light and be salt. You say, Pastor, can I not be proud of my culture? Yeah, be proud of your culture. I, I, I'm a black man and I'm, I'm proud to be black. And if you're white, be proud to be white. If you're, if you're red, be proud to be red. If you're brown, be proud to be brown. You say, why should I be proud of who I am? Because you're made in the image of God. You're a child of God. God created you in his image. No matter your skin color, no matter, no, no matter your eye color, your hair color, God made you in his image. So be proud of who God made you to be. But let me say this to the church. But first and foremost, we should be proud that we're children of God, that we're God's kids, that we belong to God, that we're a part of the family of God. And together with the power of the Holy Spirit, we can bring change. We can help bring policy change. We can help bring systematic change. And we can help as the Holy Spirit flows through us to see change of the human heart that only God can bring by his power. We need upper room power again to see change in our nation. God, fill us with the Holy Spirit.